Is uh, anybody else fully stressed out now? Anybody? <laughs> we will have massage therapists on the exit when you leave today just to help you deal with that. Happy Sunday, everybody. We're so glad you're here. Would you do me a favor and would you say hello to our Brandon campus that's joining us by video this morning, everybody? Yes. Love you guys. Really glad you're here today. We are kicking off a series in just a few minutes called How to Be Here, and I'm really, really excited to get this thing going. But before we do, I want to celebrate a couple of things with you. Um, if you're a first service attender, you didn't see this last week. At the end of second service last week, I walked off stage and we sang the song at the end. And when I came back on, I had just gotten a text from someone. And check this out. For the first time last Sunday, for the first time in the history of our church, we had over 1,000 people at Access, which is awesome. 1,027. Super cool to me. And check this out. There, there's a number that's even better than that and even bigger than that. And here's the number. The number is 25. And that's the number of people who prayed to make a decision to follow Jesus. And I love that. Don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And so, listen, like, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being the kind of church who gets it, who, who, who puts others first, who wants to reach out and make a difference in our city. And I remember a few years ago, Access was a lot smaller and we were just kind of struggling along as a church. And I remember having the sense like, will, will this ever matter? Like, will we ever make a difference? Will this church ever change the world? And in the words of that famous philosopher, Montel Jordan, this is how we do it. You know what I'm saying? Like, Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of this thing. And let's just continue to step on the gas. Let's continue to reach people all around the city and let's leverage our lives to make a difference because it really does matter. Now, what was awesome what last week is we had a lot of people pray to receive Christ. If you're here and you're one of those people, or if you're here and you've made a decision to follow Jesus, but you've never taken the next step in your relationship at Access, we're all about your next step. And today after service, we've got baptism coming up and I'm excited about it. And I want you to listen to me. If you're here and you know you haven't taken the next step, you haven't gone public and you haven't gotten baptized, on the first Sunday of every month, which happens to be today, we're doing baptism. And I want you to go get baptized today. It's right after the service. We've gotten rid of all of the excuses. If you're like, man, I didn't bring a towel. We got towels. If you're like, man, I don't have a shirt. We, we have these shirts that say made new because when you follow Jesus, you're not a better version of yourself. You're actually made new. So we've got these for you. We just, we want to help you. We've eliminated all the excuses. And so if you would like to get baptized right after the service, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. When I pray at the end of the service, at the end of the message, just quietly slip out and go out there. There will be people out there that can give you one of these shirts, and we would love to celebrate with you as you get baptized. So it's going to be awesome, all right? Let's do this. Let's pray, and let's get to work together this morning. Let's pray. Father, in these next few moments that we have together, I'm asking you to do what only you can do, which is to speak to our hearts. And God, you know that I've thought through this and I've prepared, but really, none of my preparation and none of my work matters if you don't show up and if you don't speak to us. So God, we ask you, we invite you to speak to us. We invite you to change our hearts. God, call us to a deeper level of understanding and relationship with you. We love you and we thank you for that, God. In Jesus' name, amen. A few years ago, I had an awesome opportunity. It was actually more than a few years ago. It was when I was in high school, which was way, way more than a few years ago. I uh, had an opportunity to, to go with my family overseas to the nation of Fiji. And Fiji is known around the world as this tropical hotspot, the kind of place that people, that people save up and they try to, they just go to, to vacation because it's amazing and beautiful. And Fiji is beautiful, but it is unbelievably desolate in a lot of ways. And so we went there and the, when we were there, the whole purpose for our trip was ministry. And so every morning, afternoon and night, we were doing a service. So in the morning, we would do one or two chapel services for schools. In the afternoon, we would do larger events. And then in the evening, we would do these big citywide events. And at the end of our trip, something awesome happened. Now, just the other day, it was kind of cool. I was going through some folders in my office, and I found this picture of a time that I was there. Uh, this is me on the right. Um, you couldn't tell. Um, I don't like to think of myself as skinnier in this picture. I just like to think of myself as a little more tan. Um, and um, on the left is my dad in the middle. Save your jokes. That is not my mother. That is a lady who is a native to Fiji. And we had this amazing trip. Now, at the end of the trip, we had this awesome opportunity. They told us when we, when we were planning the trip with the, the leaders there of the denomination in Fiji that we were serving, they told us at the end of the trip, we're going to do something amazing. You're coming for our big general conference, which is at the end of all of this ministry time, we're gonna come together and we're gonna have thousands and thousands of people. They, they were anticipating over 10,000 people showing up for this massive assembly. It was gonna be a big outdoor service. It was gonna be awesome. So the, the whole week that we're there, we're doing all these services, but we're looking forward to this one day that's gonna be absolutely amazing at the end. 
And the day arrives and we get there and when we get there, there's this massive stage set up outside and there's this huge open field and they're expecting, like I said, 10 to 15,000 people to show up and then something unexpected happened. Like a blanket being rolled out over the sky, this massive uh, front of dark clouds rolled in and rain began to pour. Not like little drops of rain, I'm talking massive, huge drops of rain. And it was so unbelievable how quickly the area changed. It, it was interesting, like we live in Florida where it rains all the time. This was different than a Florida storm. This was this tropical, nasty, horrible storm. And instantly the ground that was all set up for people to stand and sit on, instantly it turned to mud. Now in America, when it rains, we, we make up excuses. Like if, if it's a Sunday morning, Church is about to happen, and we look outside and it's raining. Maybe you have done this before, where you look outside and you think, you know, I just don't really want to get wet today, so we'll just stay home. But, but in Fiji, the people showed up, and thousands and thousands of people poured in, and they sat in this terrible rain, and right before the service, almost this miracle happened. It's like the rain stopped, but the ground had been terribly affected. So the rain stopped, and people are there, and the, the band gets out, and they start to play the worship songs, and the people begin to sing, and as they sing, they begin to move, and as they move, they begin to dance, and as they dance, the ground that was grass turns to mud, and pretty quickly, it wasn't just normal mud, but it was mud up to the people's mid calf people are just out there dancing and I had the luxury of being on stage I had the luxury of sitting off to the back and just watching and observing as this thing was happening and it was crazy as people they didn't seem to care like in America if it rained we would be gone if there was mud on our shoes we would be out but the people stayed they stayed there and they sang and they celebrated God's goodness and they worshiped together in this rain and the rain turned the ground into mud and people began to dance. And then my mom and dad did something crazy. They took off their shoes and they went down and they got with the people who were just celebrating. They rolled up their pants and they danced in the mud with these people. Now, the whole time we were in Fiji, we were working with this man named Suliasi Karulo. We called him Brother Suli. Brother Suli was the leader of this whole denomination, and Brother Suli, yeah, he was sitting close to me, and my parents went down and they began to dance in the mud, and all these people were celebrating, and I was just sitting on stage thinking, like, how crazy is this? And, and so in a moment of ignorance, I leaned over to Brother Suli, and I said, Brother Suli, these people are crazy. And he leaned back over to me with this deep voice, thick Fijian accent, and he said, oh, oh no, brother. These people, they are not crazy. These people, they are free. I had this moment there in Fiji where Brother Suli felt like he kicked me in the teeth because he taught me something. He, he taught me that these people weren't, they weren't held in captivity. And the funny thing about us is all of us at some point or another, we get held in some sort of captivity. For us, it doesn't necessarily mean prison, but it can mean that we're slaves to something. Slaves to fear, anxiety, worry. Slaves to our paycheck, slaves to a job, slaves to a relationship that's unhealthy. But we become slaves to things and it holds us back from living the life that we're, we were created to live. And I just realized in that moment as I'm sitting on stage in front of all these people who were free that the only person in the room who wasn't free was the idiot sitting in my seat. It was me. That you were created to be free. And one of the things I love about Jesus is that when Jesus talked, when he taught, this was one of the central messages that he taught is that you were created to be free, free from, free from anxiety, free from worry, free from depression. You were created to be free. In fact, in John chapter 10, Jesus teaches, and one of the things he says, I mean, I probably quote this verse at least five to 10 times a year. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said this. He said, the thief being Satan, he only has one purpose, and the purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. Like Satan's goal is to steal hope, to, to kill your dreams, and to destroy your life. Like that's his hope and that's his goal. But then Jesus contrasts that with this. He says, the thief only has one purpose, which is to steal, kill, and destroy. But he says that I have come, that they, which is you and me, that they may have life and have it to the full. Another translation says that they may have it with abundance. Like Jesus' intention was that you and I would experience freedom, that we wouldn't live in slavery, in captivity, our hearts wouldn't be held in bondage forever, that we could be free so that we could experience life. And the question I want to ask today is this, is what are some areas in our life where maybe unintentionally we've allowed the enemy to steal, kill, and destroy? Where we've settled into a life of captivity and slavery and we've missed out on the joy of life that God is offering and is so freely giving to us. Now, now to kind of set this up, that one of the things I want to talk about today is this, is it possible that in all of our hopes and in all of our dreams, in our efforts to create a life that is worth living, we somehow miss out on life. 
Is it possible that we settle for a life less than we were created to live because we settle for a life that is so consumed by things that don't actually matter? In the book of Matthew chapter 6, Jesus was teaching one time, and he was teaching what is called the Sermon on the Mount, one of the most beautiful sermons in the history of the world. And he stands on the side of a mountain with the Sea of Galilee off to his side, and he preaches to probably thousands of people. And in this sermon, if you read Matthew chapter 6, it's really interesting because he talks about things like divorce, he talks about things like money, and he talks about things like worry. And at one point, Jesus says, guys, look up at the sky. See the birds in the air? See them? They don't have a care in the world because they know that God is going to take care of them. And if the, your Father in heaven is going to take care of them, how much more will he take care of you? And then in Matthew chapter 6, there's this one verse, and this verse is just fascinating to me. Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, Jesus says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Don't allow your mind to be consumed by the things that are happening. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus essentially says, listen, don't allow your life to be so consumed by things that are happening around you. Regret from your past, things that are going to happen. Don't allow your mind to worry because when you worry, you miss out on what's possibly happening here and now in the moment. You miss out on your life and you were created to live. So Jesus, as he's teaching, he uses this interesting word. In Greek, the language the, the New Testament was written in, for the, for the word worry, the word there would have been the word meris, M-E-R-I-S, meris. And literally translated, meris means a part or a division. It means to be here and to be somewhere else at the same time. And Jesus says, don't worry about today. Don't allow marriage. Don't let this thing happen to you. Because what happens when you worry is this, is that you become split. You become fractured. Your heart, your energy, your emotions become fractured. And Jesus says, don't allow this. And you understand what this is like. You ever had a moment when you were somewhere, but you weren't actually there? You ever had a moment when you were so consumed by things that were happening around you? You were thinking about your past, thinking about decisions, and you were so consumed by things that have happened that you miss what was happening. This last summer, my wife and I, we, we saved up our money for a long time, and we saved up a ton of frequent flyer miles, and we went to Hawaii on a vacation. And this trip was to celebrate our 10-year anniversary. What was awesome was the trip also coincided with our 10-year anniversary of my wife being diagnosed with cancer, just kind of testimony to God's goodness. And we saved up all this money to go on this trip, and we went, and we were going to go for seven days and have an amazing time in Hawaii. And we get there, and we have a blast, and there's so many fun things to do in Hawaii. But I remember on, like, the third day of vacation, we were just hanging out, and my wife, she kind of took me by the shoulders, and she looked me in the eyes, and she said, hi, hi. I said, hello? And she said, hi. I said, what? She goes, you're finally here. And I said, what? She goes, you're finally here. The weeks leading up to this trip to Hawaii were some of the busiest weeks of my life, honestly. Besides pastoring our church, I have a, a little side company that I run that helps and consults with churches all over the country. And, and this season was unbelievably busy for me. And at this point, I didn't have anyone working with me or anyone helping me. And I was so consumed trying to do all this work in order to get to be able to be free for the vacation that I worked myself into oblivion. I worked myself in, into crazy tiredness. I just worked myself to the point where I wasn't really even able to rest. There were weeks leading up to this trip that I was sleeping about two to three hours every single night. I was physically, mentally exhausted. I had hit a wall and I got there. And what was funny was I was there. I was in the place that all of us would love to go, the place that all of us would trade anything we had just to go spend a week in paradise, a week away from your kids, a week just to go have fun and relax with your bride. I was excited about this trip and I got there and for three days I wasn't even there because I was so consumed. It's like I was in a place that everyone would give anything to go, but I wasn't even there. And Jesus said this in Matthew 6, he says, don't worry about tomorrow, which means this, don't let your head be so consumed by what is still to do that you miss where you are. Now, all of us have experienced this at one point or another, haven't we? This week, my radar was turned on and I heard multiple people say things like, I can't believe how fast my kids are growing up. Well, where did the time go? I wish we could slow down time. Don't blink or you'll miss it. And all of us know what this is like, because maybe you've had this experience before where it's like you blink and you wake up the next day and your kid is going to kindergarten. And, and you blink again and they're walking across the graduation stage. Maybe you don't have kids yet and you've thought to yourself, if I can just get myself through high school and you blink and you find yourself sitting in a cap and a steaming hot gown waiting to walk across the stage and you're like, where did the time go? You see, Jesus understood something, that if we're going to fully live, we have to be able to understand what it means how to be here. 
how to be in this moment, not to be split, not to be divided, but to experience this moment that we're actually living in. So, so for me, if I'm honest, this is something I struggle with. This is something because I've always got a lot of things to do and because I want to be a visionary leader, so I'm always thinking about what's coming and I'm always thinking about what is ahead of me and yet there are these moments, there are these speed bumps in my life where it's like reality smacks me in the face and I realize I'm missing this, I'm missing this. This week my wife said something to me and it just, it hit me. She said, you know, Jason, when we're together with our kids, they'll only ask me questions, they don't ask you questions. You ever notice? They're like, mom, mom, mom. Mommy, they always ask her questions, they don't, they don't come to me. And I'm just thinking about it and I wonder if it's possible that even when I'm with my kids, there are times when I'm with them, but my head is somewhere else. My heart is consumed by someone else's problems, by something that is still on my to-do list. My head and my heart just aren't where they're supposed to be. And Jesus says, listen, let tomorrow take care of itself. Tomorrow has enough problems of its own. Be here. Don't miss the moment. If you miss the moment, you're gonna miss your life. In the book of James, James gives us even further instructions, and here's what I love about James. You see, so often we get ourselves consumed about what's coming and we miss the moments now, but there are others of us that our whole headspace is consumed by what is in the past. And so what happens is we stand on the outskirts of our lives, looking in at our life, judging our life. And the problem is when you stand on the outside of your life, looking in at your life and judging your life, you're actually missing your life. You're constantly watching a replay but never experiencing you're constantly watching a replay, something that has already happened over and over and over, and you're missing the moments that are happening right here in front of you, all around you. And James even helps, his language helps to put into context what it means. James chapter four, he says this. He says, now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city and spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What, what is your life? What is it? Because you are a mist. You're a mist that appears for a little while and vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, it is the, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. You see, so many of us, we get so focused on what is happening around us that we miss life. And what James says is whether it's because of your past or whether it's because you're focused on your future, you're missing it. And what you don't understand is that life, he says, is a mist. It's here for a moment and then it's it's gone. It's a, it's a mist. It's just here, and then it's over. If you've ever sat in a funeral service for someone you love, especially if it was someone who died, in your opinion, prematurely, you have this moment when you face reality and you realize that the words of James are true, that life, it's here, and then it's, it's gone. It's here for just a moment, and then you can't see it anymore. We don't control the day we're born, and we don't control the day we die, but life comes at us fast. So what James is saying is this. He says, if you're not careful, you'll miss it. If you're not careful, you'll miss out on this beautiful gift that God has given you, the gift of life. So the challenge for us, the goal for us as we kick off the series, is my challenge for you is I want you to become what I call fully present. Our goal is that we become fully present. That we make a decision that we're going to live here and now. That we're gonna slow down all the busyness we're gonna deal with our past so that we can embrace the moments that God has given us. Like what would it look like for you if you were able to eliminate the phrases from your vocabulary like life is just flying by. I blink and then it's over. I blink and she's older. I blink and then it's gone. Like what would it look like if we were able to so enjoy the moments that God has given us, to embrace these moments that we don't miss out on the life that God created us for? Now, in the book of Exodus, chapter 24, something interesting is happening. God is speaking to a guy named Moses, and Moses is this epic hero of our faith. And in four chapters earlier, Exodus chapter 20, God says to Moses, come up on this mountain, and I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments, these rules, the, the baseline standard for all of humanity. So Moses goes onto this mountain, God gives him the Ten Commandments, and these people are now, they're, they're faced with their reality. They have to make a decision to live for God. Four chapters later, God says to Moses again, I want you to come up and I want you to spend some time with me and I've got further instructions. I've got things that I wanna share with you. I've got things that I wanna do with you. And I wanna look at this verse with you because this verse, if you just read it quickly, you're gonna miss something really powerful. Exodus chapter 24, verse 12 says this, the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay here. Come up on the mountain and stay here. And then I will give you the tablets of stone and the law and the commandments I have written for their instruction. God says to Moses, come up on the mountain, I want you to stay on the mountain. Now, in English, when we read that, it kind of makes sense, but if we were to go back to Hebrew, the language the actual Bible was written in, the Old Testament was written in, it, it's almost confusing. 
The word stay in Hebrew is the word haya, H-A-Y-A, which is super fun to say, haya, that's the word. And the word haya literally translated, it just means to be or to exist. The word haya means to be or to exist. So if you read it in that context, the verse says, God says to Moses, come up on the mountain and be he on the mountain. Come up on the mountain and be with me on the mountain. Now it's kind of weird. Now scholars say one of two things is happening in this verse. Either God is stuttering, which he isn't because he's God. He's not stuttering. He didn't go to the school of redundancy school. He didn't. Like God understands what he's saying. Okay. So either God stutters, which isn't the case, or God is trying to get a point across to Moses. Now here's the point God's making to Moses. If you've ever climbed a mountain, if you've ever found yourself climbing a tree and you finally reach the pinnacle, the place that you were wanting to get to, immediately when you get there, where does your focus and attention shift? How do I get back? How do I get down? And God says to Moses, I want you to come up here and once you're here, I actually want you to be here. I want you to come up to the mountain and when you're on the mountain, I want you to be on the mountain with me because if you're not, what'll happen is you'll get here and when I'm trying to speak to you, when I'm trying to encourage you, when I'm trying to give you the things that I have for you, you will miss the moment if you're trying to think about how do I get back down? And I wonder for us, how many of us, this is our reality. How many of us, our reality is we're so focused to get somewhere, to do something, to accomplish something that when we get there, we can't even enjoy it we can't even experience it because we're so focused on getting somewhere else from there. The goal is to be fully present. Now, I want to give you um, two very practical ways this affects all of us. And this is something that I struggle with. The first place that I struggle with this is in the area of my technology. Now, I am an Apple fanboy. Um, I love Apple. Ooh. How many of you just feel so relaxed when you hear that sound? Anybody? Just me? Isn't there this part of you that maybe, maybe for you this, this song, this ringtone feels, it feels like the metaphor, the anthem of your life. Because you're so busy. The phone's always ringing. And someone always wants your attention. And so it's always ringing. You hear this sound over and over and over. You hear this sound in your sleep. You can't seem to get over it. It's just over. And can we stop it before I jump off the stage and hurt somebody? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. But how many for us, this is the reality that we are controlled by our technology and the technology which was created to give us freedom actually causes us to be slaves to it. I, listen, let me be the first one to admit I struggle with this one. I have Apple everything. I love computers. I love technology. In fact, if I'm not careful, I will spend every possible moment on my phone because I, I enjoy it. Maybe you're like me, like I try not to use my phone when I'm driving, but when I'm at a stoplight, I'm not driving. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so like, I gotta know what's happening on Facebook. I gotta know what's happening on my text world. Maybe somebody needs me. We get the Batman complex. We think that everybody needs us all the time. So, so I've started noticing something about myself, and you probably don't struggle with this, but sometimes I'll sit down at lunch with someone, and the first thing I do before I even talk to them is I'll pull my phone out, and I'll set it on the table. And I've noticed that what I'm unintentionally saying to them is it is possible that someone more important than you is going to need to interrupt my attention from you. So, so I put the phone here. And then what happens when the phone rings? Now I have this awkward moment, this awkward decision. Do I, either, do I either like forget about you for a moment and leave you just sitting there awkwardly twiddling your thumbs while I deal with whatever's more important? What's up, bro? You want to meet at the mall later? You know, like stuff that's really ultimately earth shattering. Do I do that? Or, or do I ignore them and focus on you? But in, instantly there's this awkward division between us. So then, so then a few months ago, I had this great idea. Apple released this watch and I got one because I wanted to have it. And I remember, <laughs> Um, my justification for getting the watch was this, is that when I'm meeting with people or, or working with people, counseling people, like I get, I get texts all the day, all, all the time, all day it feels like. And, um, but like I usually can ignore it. It's usually no big deal. But when my wife calls or when my wife texts me, I like to be able to respond right away in case there's something going on. And so um, I, I got this watch thinking, here's what'll happen. When people text me, it'll show up on my watch now. So what I can do is I can just glance at my watch. If it's no big deal, I can put it away. So I've got this friend named Pete, and Pete is awesome, but Pete in some ways 
I think we both drive each other crazy, which is why we're friends. And so I'm sitting with Pete and I, I put my phone away because Pete will just call you on your junk when it comes to your phone. So when I'm with Pete, I put my phone away so he doesn't see it. I don't want to bother him. But, but my phone will buzz. I'll feel it in my pocket and I'll just wonder who it is. And so I'll look at my watch just to see. And it's a quick glance. It may be someone that's not important and something that's not urgent. And I'll glance and if it's no big deal, I'll put it away. But sometimes I'll look and I'll be like, what, bro? You got something more important to do? You ever have that person that calls you on everything, you know what I'm talking about? And so he's here on the front row and I'm not looking at him. And, uh, <laughs> and so like these things that are intended to bring us closer together, they unintentionally push us away from each other. The area of technology is this way that we think that we're closer together, but the reality is we're farther away. I, I read just, to, uh, I mean, I heard this week something interesting. In China, they're actually installing lanes on sidewalks for people who want to text and walk at the same time because people are running into each other and walking out into traffic and not even noticing. How crazy is this? I, I read that there was this app that was created so that when you're texting, your, your camera can come on so you can see where you're going while you're texting at the same time. Like, what is wrong with us as a culture when we need this stuff? Some of you are like, that's awesome, write that down. Like, <laughs> like you need to see a therapist, honestly. Okay, so, so the area of technology, like, I'm challenging you to, to take a break. I'm challenging you, like, when you sit down at the dinner table, like, put, put the phone in, in a different room. I'm challenging you on this, and I'm challenging myself on this, okay? Now, the first one is the area of technology. Think about another area, the area of food, okay? Now, how many places, and when we talk about food, are we also talking about speed? When we think about food, we often think about speed. Like, check out this list of, of these words. Fast food, express lunch, go-gurt, drive-thru, ready in minutes, minute rice. And for those of you who don't have a minute for your rice, 59-second rice is now available. <laughs> And all of these words, all these things that we talk about when we think about food, gogurt, it's yogurt on the go. You don't have to sit, you can take it with you. All of these words that we think about when we think about food, all of them express speed. And the reality is when you look through scripture, often meals are places that are sacred. They're often places that we connect with each other. So I, I made a decision, I was challenged by this years ago. And I was, I was challenged because there was this part of me that's so driven to want to do things that, that I was not having lunch with anybody. I was just trying to like use my lunch hour to get more stuff done. But then I realized that lunch is this awesome opportunity every day for me to try to connect with someone and to actually really connect with them. I wonder for us, how many of us were so consumed by busy and getting things done and doing stuff that we miss, we miss these opportunities and we miss these moments. You ever had a moment when you had a dinner planned with friends, you, you guys sit around and you eat, and the meal that could take 30 minutes if you were rushing through it, it takes a couple hours, and dinner's over and you still find yourself sitting around the table just talking, and then, then you leave and you say something like, man, that was so great. We, we've got to do that more often because there's something sacred about this time. And I could come up with a thousand different examples of ways that we get busy and ways we get rushed, but I just wanna challenge you with this question. But where are the areas in your life where you're constantly hurrying? And in hurrying and all of your busyness, you're missing right now. But where are those moments? Some years ago, I read a book by a guy named John Ortberg, one of my favorite authors, one of my favorite preachers. And he told a story about when he was younger, he got the opportunity to sit down with a guy who was one of the most brilliant theologians ever. And he sat down with the guy and he asked him this question. He says, okay, what is the number one secret to growing in your relationship with God? But what is the number one secret in, our, in order to grow in your relationship with God? And the man said back, he goes, Here's, here it is, okay. The number one secret to growing in your relationship with God is work to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. That's what he said. And then John said, okay, well, what's the next thing? And he goes, no, that, that's it. Ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. You see, you can't do anything that matters in a hurry. You can't slow dance in a hurry can't have a conversation that means something in a hurry. can't raise your kids in a hurry. You can't do anything in, that matters in life in a hurry. can't listen in a hurry. can't show love in a hurry. can't do anything in, matter, that, in life that matters in a hurry. So here's my challenge to you. Here's how we're going to end today. I want to challenge you this week and next week to make a conscious decision to be here. To not miss the moments in life that God's given us, but to actually be here. Let me give you a couple practical examples of ways 
that you can work to eliminate hurry in your life, okay? And this is gonna reveal some stuff in you. This is something I struggle with, okay? When you pull up to a red light and there's two cars sitting in the two lanes, do you do what I do and subconsciously think, I bet you this one's gonna go faster? <laughs> Just me, okay, perfect, okay. Uh, and so you get behind it, okay, listen. I challenge you, what if you just intentionally took the slow lane? Okay, here's another challenge. What if this week, when you're on the interstate, when you're on I-4, I-75 going somewhere, what if you just stayed in the slow lane and just stayed? Isn't there this part of you that's like cringing at this thought? Okay. okay, does anyone do this? When you go to a store, Publix, Target, Walmart, do you ever go and you look at all the lines that are open and you pick the one that you think is going to go the fastest? Does anybody do this? Okay, this is how you'll know you're really sick. Do you also mark the people who are at the same spot in line as you to see if you get through faster than them? Okay, okay. I challenge you this week. I challenge you to pick the line that you think is going to go the slowest. Okay, I know this is weird, okay? But do this. So you can remind yourself that sometimes hurrying doesn't matter. Sometimes it doesn't. You can't do anything that matters in a hurry. So what would it look like if you did some things intentionally, they're kind of dumb, but you did some things intentionally to slow down, to remind yourself you can't do anything that matters in a hurry. And what would it look like if this week all of us worked to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives? I think what'll happen is we'll experience relationships differently. I think we'll enjoy things more. I challenge you when you eat to make a conscious decision to chew every bite at least 15 times before you swallow it. Like we're so programmed, chew, swallow fast to get through the meal. Stop and enjoy. And what I believe will happen is this, is that when you do this, when you work to eliminate hurry from your life, you'll experience life and you'll experience God in a profound, different kind of way. How do you live the life that Jesus calls us to? How do you become the person who dances in the mud and not the idiot who sits on the stage and judges? How do you do that? By learning what it means to be fully present and understanding what it means to be here and now. Let me pray for you all across this room. Let me pray. Jesus, help us as we endeavor to swim against the stream of culture. Our culture teaches us that the goal is to go faster, to do more, to accomplish more. And God, I'm concerned that in doing so, we, we miss out on the life that you've called us to live. So God, I pray today that you'll call us to a deeper level of relationship with you. And part of that's going to just be trusting going to be trusting that when we trust you with the details of our life that you'll help in ways that we can't even understand. It means trusting you in parts of our life that seem that they seem so rushed, they seem so hurried. God, we, we thank you. We thank you that you, you want to call us something else, something better to experience the kind of life that Jesus promised in John 10 where we can have life and life to the fullest or life with abundance. God, for some of us, this message felt like a kick in the gut because we feel like we've missed the last five years of our life. We've missed the last 10 years of our life. Okay, give us the courage to eliminate hurry so we can experience life. Thank you for that, God. Now, before you go, before anyone moves, if you're here and you know you're not in right standing with God, I don't know what that means for you. I don't know if it means you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, or maybe you prayed a prayer as a kid, or you got baptized as an infant, and you just, but you've never made a decision on your own to follow Jesus. And if today you're here and you just want to make a decision to surrender your life to Jesus, to, to let him be the leader of your life, if that's you, I'm going to pray with you. But would you just let me know you want to pray with me by just raising your hand right now? No one's looking, no one's talking. This moment's just between you and God. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, five more seconds. We have several people already respond. If this is you, here's your moment. Thank you. If you raised your hand, even if you didn't, and you know in your heart that you want to do this, I'm going to ask you to pray this with me. Hear me say this. Praying a prayer doesn't make you a Christian, but following Jesus, really surrendering your life to him does. And so would you do this? Would you pray with me now? Would you say, Jesus, today I make this decision. I surrender my life to you. I believe that you are the son of God and you came and lived for me. You died on the cross for me and you rose again from the dead for me. And because of what you did for me on the cross, you, you paid the price for my sins. And so today I confess that I've sinned I, and I make this decision to surrender my life to you. 
I believe that when you died, you paid the price for my sins. And when you rose again from the dead, you gave me the ability to experience life eternally with you. So Jesus, I make this decision. I surrender my life to you now. And from this day forward, I'll live for you. I love you, Jesus. And I surrender my life. In your name I pray. Amen. Hey, look at me, everybody. We just had several people pray to make that decision. Let's celebrate with them. Yeah. Love it, love it, love it, love it.